All right. We are broadcasting live. Welcome to Phil's First Party Parlay, special business interruption early edition. Uh, on Phil's First Party Parlay, we talk all things timely and topical in the insurance restoration industry. I'm Phil Sanoff, trial lawyer with Morgan & Morgan's Insurance Recovery Group. With Morgan & Morgan's Insurance Recovery Group, I have 55 of the most awesome attorney colleagues you could ever want to know. We are in 25 offices, 13 states. If you have any problem with any insurance claim, you need to come see us. You can reach us through our website, forthepeople.com, hit pound LAW from any cell phone anywhere, or just call me on my personal cell. We'll figure it out. 713-825-3444. Morgan & Morgan Insurance Recovery Group. Come see us. Joining us today is one of those awesome attorney colleagues, Paul Pritchard. I'm going to wait until Paul comes in, and then I'll give a more full, adequate introduction to my friend Paul. Paul, hit that magic button. Come see us, please. There he Afternoon, is. Afternoon, Phil. How you doing? Doing very well today. Thank you. Great, great. We appreciate you being here on the special early edition for Phil's First Party Parlay to discuss business interruption claims. Paul, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction of you now. I probably am going to embarrass you a little bit, but it's one of the things that I sometimes like to do. Uh, <laughs> right. That was very nice. That was Bring very it. nice. Uh, what folks need to know about Paul Paul is the premier legal reader, writer, researcher, and analyst that I have ever known. I've been practicing law over 30 years, and there is no one that can analyze the facts and the law and how things should be applied better than Paul. Paul, you need to know how we are all grateful to you. One of the things that Paul has the most trouble with is setting expectations. We all know how good Paul is. And so we all go to Paul pretty quick and expect him to work his magic, but he's working magic for everybody all at once. So it can get a little bit challenging. Uh, Paul has been practicing law for well over two decades, uh, doing primarily first party work and appellate work for the last 15, uh, working on, on insurance claims and how the law applies and the, the appellate process for those. Uh, Paul uh, went to Tulane Law School and uh, then joined us out here in the world practicing law. We're really grateful for you to, to take the time to come with us this afternoon, Paul. Absolutely. Thank you for the time and opportunity to speak with you. You bet. You bet. So, so Paul, you know how this works. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer uh, and very grateful for you <laughs> your appellate practice with keeping me in line. Uh, and so I believe in the magic of three, the power of three. We always start off the show outlining what three points are going to be discussed and then come back to fill in more information about each point as we go. Before we get into the three points that you're going to initially address today, let me tell the attendees that we have here. Paul, you can simply focus on talking about the points and answering the questions as I bring them to you. Okay. Uh, we had some pre-show email from some attendees, and so let me address that a little bit. Uh, folks here live with us, if you have a question, if you have a comment about something that you want Paul to expand on, or if you have a question you need us to address, please type it in the Zoom chat aspect. I will read the question and then bring it to Paul during the 30 minutes that we have here allocated for the show. Uh, if you know how to make the electronic version work where you electronically raise your hand in the attendee list, uh, I keep reaching to the side of my screen because that's where I have it open. If you know how to raise your hand, please do, and I can unmute you so you can speak directly back and forth. The interaction there is often more helpful. So we are happy to do the unmute and have you bring your question on your own. If you're more comfortable or it doesn't work for you, to, to raise your hand electronically, then you can type your comments and questions in the chat part, and I will be monitoring that to bring it up. So Paul, we're now at the point uh, in the show where we transition to you telling us the three points you want to address about business interruption claims today, and then we'll go back and fill them in as we go. 
Sure, I, I'd like to start talking about uh, triggers for coverage under uh, property insurance policies that business owners would typically have. Okay. I'd like to segue into a lot of the exclusions we're seeing um, when there is not a virus exclusion in the policy. Uh, the insurers are still asserting many of the other exclusions uh, that the policy contains. And then I'd like to talk about the various virus exclusions we see and uh, the potential for getting around some of those that seem to be a very direct and upfront exclusion. Um, we think we've got some ways to address uh, some of the problems that those exclusions raise. We've had a lot of good lawyers uh, spending a lot of time over the last three weeks really dissecting each word, each punctuation, and so there are some arguments that have come up to where those may not apply since the carrier has to apply, has to prove every word and every punctuation in their exclusions. I'm grateful to you to be here to help explain those. Now, attendees, with those three points being laid out, if that raises any questions, if that brings anything to mind on what may or may not be covered with that list, please electronically raise your hand if you know how, um, or type out the Zoom chat question and we will we will keep addressing that as we go okay Paul uh, since there's nothing yet over here from any of the attendees please go into uh, the first aspect of what are the the triggers for coverage under the typical property policies that we see sure well one thing that we're counseling our insureds to do is to uh, when they present their initial claim to their carrier uh, to phrase it in terms of seeking all available coverage under the policy. We've seen a situation where someone asks for uh, business income or business interruption coverage, and the insurer's response is, you don't have business income or business interruption coverage. But they do have time elements coverage, which is really the same thing, but by a different name. Uh, similarly, we've had someone ask their insurer for civil authority coverage because it's a term they've heard in the media. And the insurer replies, you do not have civil authority coverage. Uh, their particular policy did not contain a separate civil authority coverage. But again, we believe that there is coverage under other aspects of the policy, uh, which means submitting a supplemental claim, which means delaying the process uh, further. The obvious trigger uh, within those all available coverages would be something along the lines of a business interruption or a business income claim. Um, that's the most obvious. Uh, the government has shut me down because of uh, the stay at home orders or because of specific orders, executive orders uh, issued by a governor that directly target my business. Um, if I own a restaurant, maybe I'm no longer allowed to have seating inside and only allowed to do uh, carry out, take out, or outdoor seating with a distance. I think now we're starting to phase back in uh, to uh, some facilities reopening, but they're only allowed to open at 25% or 50% of capacity um, and enforce distancing requirements that weren't there before. So their business has been interrupted. Uh, their business income stream has been um, been stalled, delayed, diminished. Um, and so many of them do not know that their property insurance policy provides coverage for that. When they submit the claim, the carriers uh, uniformly, we, re we see a rejection that says uh, you do not have damage to your property. And that's really a, a misstatement of most of the coverages we see. Most of the coverages we see uh, use as the trigger for coverage, direct physical loss of or damage to property. And that or is a big uh, disjunctive in there. Damage to property is one trigger for coverage, direct physical loss of property is another. And the best example that I like to use is if I had a Rolex watch, which I do not, but if I had one and it got stolen, I suffered direct physical loss of my watch. It was direct in that it was proximate by the theft, 
it was physical in that it was actual and, and tangible. And it was a loss of because I no longer have it. I'm no longer able to use my watch for its intended purpose. It's different from damage too. The person who stole my watch does not want to damage that Rolex. So there's a distinction that's been uh, gone back to, uh, I believe the early fifties in insurance policies between this direct physical loss of and damage to. The insurers want to focus on damage. We want to focus on direct physical loss of. There is plenty of authority throughout the country that a loss of a building's ability to function for its intended purpose constitutes a direct physical loss. Great. Some jurisdictions don't subscribe to that theory, but most that we're running across do. One thing I'd like to, to pivot a little bit, Paul, I have two points. Uh, now that I think we're at a break point, I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, the first point is that we've had a question from one of the attendees uh, who asked me to read it to you. So we'll get to that. Um, but even before then, uh, we also, every Thursday, every Thursday at 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Morgan & Morgan Insurance Recovery Group presents a fight for your business interruption claim payout hosted by um, our senior partner boss, Mark Nation, double board certified trial lawyer, Mark Nation. Uh, I would ask you to look at my business Facebook page, Phil Sanoff, first party policyholder attorney, uh, and we will have the link on there to register or uh, forgive me, Paul, this is a show to highlight you. Uh, my text number is 713-825-3444. Um, I'm holding this up slowly so you can write it down or get it down somehow if you need it. You can text me just a short note that says link for tomorrow and I will text you the link to also register. There'll be topics covered today that aren't covered tomorrow. There'll be topics covered tomorrow that weren't covered today. They all, it's the interaction that brings up the content. So please, if you're attending today, also sign up for that one and be with us tomorrow afternoon and every Thursday afternoon for Morgan & Morgan Insurance Recovery Group presents Fight for Your Insurance Claim Business Interruption Payout. Um, now, Paul, thank you for that little segue. Uh, there's a question here that I believe you and I would answer it the same. I'm going to throw it to you to answer, and then I'll fill in if I have any additional thoughts. Um, I hope I don't butcher the name uh, attendee, sir. Michael Agras asked the question, are you filing your cases in state or federal court? My concern is once they are filed in federal court, they will be consolidated with MDLs. Most cases I have trigger diversity, so federal court is the likely venue. Are you concerned with getting swallowed up in an MDL? He asked me to read that as opposed to unmuting him. And so this is, is you're the panelist on our show today. I'll probably have something to fill in. I don't have to just stay over and not say anything, but let me get your take on it. I, we've talked about this so much before. I'm sure we'll have much the same take on it. I'll, I'll give you our, our general thoughts on this is if, if possible, we bring the case in state court. We have several going in state court now. If probable that it's going to go to federal court, we just draft the complaint uh, with an eye towards the federal action and file directly in federal so we don't waste the time of getting removed and, uh, and get things knowing. We know we're inevitably going to be there. We just go ahead and go there. I personally am not real concerned about getting dragged into any type of MDL. The policies we see are so diverse. The exclusions are uh, so varied. I'll have a Hartford policy that has a virus exclusion, and I'll see another Hartford policy that does not have a virus exclusion. I'll have a banker's policy that has um, a business interruption coverage, a, a banker's policy uh, that, that, I'm sorry, civil authority coverage, a banker's policy that won't have civil authority coverage. Uh, we see inland marine policies. We see Lloyd's policies, I'm going to talk about them a little bit later on. Some have no exclusion, some have a, a direct exclusion, some have an exclusion that kind of waffles around the perimeter. 
I think the issues with each individual policy and each client are, are too great and each nature of loss is too great. Um, our practice is based in, in Florida. Uh, we've got a, a barricade at the beginning of the Florida Keys. You cannot go into the Keys unless you have a driver's license with a local address. That is a different type of impact on your business income than a uh, restaurant that might be able to uh, still operate at almost full capacity um, that primarily would do a takeout business anyway. So I think it's the, the claims are too varied to, to cause us concern right now. And, and I would just add to that uh, in, in full agreement and just expanding on what Paul said, um, I'm a big fan of federal court. As Paul knows, I like to file things directly into federal court because I like being in federal court with federal judges that set deadlines and hold that deadlines. As a trial lawyer, uh, I believe that trial settings make magic. I like getting my verdicts and it's much quicker and easier. I find around the country when I'm in a particular federal court than in some different state court, all the various states that I go to try cases in. So that's point number one. I'm a big advocate for filing directly into federal court. Uh, point number two about the MDLs, I would just mirror what Paul said, and it's the feeling within our brain trust at the Insurance Recovery Group with Morgan & Morgan that we believe there are those that are going to file for MDLs. We've already seen a few MDL petitions with, with several class actions that were filed around the country. Our, our belief up, down, and sideways, as we say where I'm from, is that the claims are so different. The, as, as Paul said, the policies, the exclusions are so different. We just can't see the panel really finding this to be such a, a commonality that the MDL is a viable option going forward in that way. Um, we could be wrong. We've been wrong before. We hope we're not, uh, but that's our take on it. That, that's what we, what we believe. Um, Paul, we've got another question we should address before we, sure. we move on here. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> Michael says, thanks. You're welcome. I hope that adequately answered your question. If it didn't, please do. I, I hope you got my number if you need to contact me. Um, and if, if, uh, if there's additional questions from it, sir, please, please type some more, some more in here. But so far, he's just said, thanks, Paul. So I think we addressed his, his question. The next question is, can these types of insurance claims be brought for essential businesses as well? Also, I apologize, my microphone is not working. Can you read it aloud instead of unmuting me? Okay, Jane, but next time you got to get your microphone fixed and come back to see us again tomorrow. Uh, so, Paul, here we go. What are your, do you, can you address that question? Do you yeah, I, I, I think there is, is a viable cause of action. Um, there's a, a theory that the, cause of the loss was the uh, proclamation, whether you're an essential business or non-essential business. I kind of back up from that and, and go more of a, that's related to the virus. And so uh, related causes of loss, uh, I subscribe to the efficient proximate cause doctrine. I think the efficient proximate cause of all of this is a virus. So if you have, if your uh, insured has suffered any business interruption or loss of business income, uh, whether that's uh, essential business or non-essential business, I, I think that there's a viable claim there. I would like, we represent a lot of dentists and they are essential as to emergency procedures. They are non-essential as to elective or cosmetic procedures. So while they are still open for emergency business, uh, they're, uh, income for the for the for 99 percent of what they do has been has been shut off so um that's an example i think even hospitals that we hear are essential and open um have shut down their elective procedures and processes and so so they don't even have a, you know in the, in the media um rural hospitals in in dire financial straits because they don't have uh the income that they normally get uh even though they're named an essential business. So I wouldn't, uh, I personally don't subscribe to the, to the concept that whether you're an essential business precludes you from making this type of claim. 
And the, the one thing that I would add to that, Paul, is I agree completely with what you said on the essential versus non-essential having a claim or not having a claim. I've seen a few policies in prior years and not as much on these yet. So maybe we won't be facing this hurdle, but the, the business interruption claim hurdle that I've been doing this for so many years and the, the challenge that I found in the past is when the policy exclusion reads total cessation of business uh, as opposed to lower your business or, or business income loss. Uh, or operations if a, affected. If a, right, right. If a, if a restaurant has an exclusion that reads for your total cessation of business, that's going to be more difficult. I, sometimes the exclusions are written to where there are losses that are excluded. And we just have to say, we're sorry. We, we think you don't have a claim on this one, which we have to turn claims away all the time. But when it's a total cessation and they're still allowed to have carry out or delivery, that's going to be more of a factor of whether they have a viable claim or not as opposed to essential versus non-essential. It, it really still comes back to the, always comes back to what does the policy say? And it's how that particular exclusion is written and what does the carrier have to prove in order to carry their burden of proving the exclusion. Sure. Um, I, hope, I hope this answers your questions. Jane, thank you for bringing that up. If, I, if we missed anything or if that spurred anything else for all the other folks that are attending or with Jane, Jane says, thank you. So I guess we, at least address that piece for her. Um, we're going to be, I think, segueing, transitioning into speak about some specific exclusions or maybe policies that don't have exclusions. Paul, I don't want to give any of this a short, shorter time than it deserves. So I think we'll only be able to cover one or the other. I'm going to have to bring you back next week uh, because I've been told on our time we have to hold it real tight to the 30 minute window. Okay. Uh, so let me pause here again and say, if you have any questions, please, those are more help um, to make sure that we address the specific issues that the attendees want to see. I don't see anything else at this moment, Paul. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to you. You're going to come back next week. So just take whichever one of these that you want to address now, and we'll save the, the other one for the next show and add to it as we go. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the the specific virus exclusions we're seeing. Uh, before I do that, I want to throw a little teaser, and hopefully I will have the information by next week's show. Uh, we've seen an indication that in the industry, uh, some carriers consider that a loss of use is a uh, damage to property, uh, more specifically under a CGL definition of damage to property. Um, when there is no conflicting definition in the um, first party property coverage, that definition should apply there. It shows the insurer's intent on, uh, on what they included or what they intended uh, to be covered by the definition of damage, physical damage to property. Hopefully by next week, I'll have some of those industry materials to be able to share. And so uh, I'm glad you brought up that teaser, Paul. I didn't know if we were going to make sure to get that in. We are working uh, diligently to get that industry information compiled so that we can let folks know and announce that on the show. Thank you for remembering to bring that up. My hope is that we're not going to be limited by the direct physical loss of property, meaning the loss of ability for it to function for its intended purpose. Um, we are seeing several uh, different virus exclusions. Some of them are extremely broad. Um, if we have time, I'll, I'll touch base. Uh, they almost look insurmountable. I think we've got a way that we can work around those. Um, some of them uh, are, are very weak, and I think we can easily defeat them, and some of them are kind of in between. Uh, at first, we were looking at these. We were putting the virus exclusion policies on the back burner, um, not knowing because of, of the cause of loss is ultimately trace back to, to the virus. If people say, well, pandemic isn't excluded, well, what is the pandemic? It's a broad application of the virus over a large area. So the virus exclusion applies, even if it's, if it's a pandemic. Um, what we're seeing with a lot of these virus exclusions is that even though the policy trigger is for direct physical loss of or damage to property, 
the virus exclusion applies to damage to property. And it, is, it intentionally or unintentionally leaves out the direct physical loss of, leaving that is still a covered cause of loss. Exclusions, limitations, narrowly construed against the insurance company that drafted the policy, broadly construed in favor of coverage, and looking at the rules of construction of insurance policies, that exclusion uh, doesn't apply to direct physical loss of property. So we think we've got a, 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 a good handle on the cases that, that limit the virus exclusion uh, to damage to property. And if you think about it, uh, that makes sense. Uh, and, and this is, I think, a strong argument for cases that, that are brought in jurisdictions um, that subscribe to the reasonable expectation theory of coverage. Um, if I buy a property insurance policy, I reasonably expect that any exclusions or limitations that are on are going to apply to my physical structure of my building. And so if I've got a mold exclusion, that's something that's internal that affects my building. It doesn't affect my neighbor down the street. If I've got a fungi exclusion, if I've got a water damage exclusion, those apply to my structure. Therefore, if I have a virus exclusion, that applies to my structure, not to somebody down the street. So I think we've got a, a great um, way to defeat a lot of the virus exclusions that we're seeing. And they wrote it, they have to prove it if they bring up the exclusion, and so it applies the way that they wrote it to the exclusions that they applied it for. Right. And then one last thing, I know we're, we're short on time. Uh, I, I, hopefully we can leave some time for some questions. There, there is a microorganism exclusion uh, that's out there. And there are actually several different versions that we've seen. Uh, some say uh, we exclude for uh, loss, injury, damage caused by bacteria, mold, fungi, or other microorganism. Some say we exclude coverage for bacteria, fungi, virus, or other microorganism. So the question is, is a virus a microorganism? And I have spoken with uh, microbiologists and uh, epidemiologists and organic chemists all over the country. Right, I was just gonna say, not in just one spot, right, right, right. And uh, just got off the phone with one again last night, and his answer is, it depends on who you ask. It depends. <laughs> the virus is kind of a unique uh, entity. It is DNA that requires a host to replicate. It is not living. The characteristics, the primary characteristic of an organism, therefore a microorganism, is that it is living and can reproduce uh, without the assistance of a, of a host, a virus yeah. or like a parasite. However, while half the authoritative literature out there says a virus is definitely not a microorganism, the other half, and it's split about 50-50, says that it is. I was just um, going to ask you, what does the other half say? Right. The taxonomy of a virus is with, included with other microorganisms. So if virus is included in the definition of microorganism, I'd say we need to work other ways around that microorganism exclusion. If it is not, I think we have a perfect argument for ambiguity. Um, not only can uh, professionals not agree on, on whether it is or is not a microorganism, I think we look to the fact that some insurers actually include it in their definition and that other uh, insurers that don't I think we look to uh, our general, general contractual construction doctrines, a justum ge generis, um, noscitur a socius, a, a word is known by the company it keeps, or when, uh, when general term follows more specific terms, the general term is of the same kind as the specific term. When they say uh, mold, fungi or bacteria, fungi, mold, or other microorganism, they're talking about living things. And so I think we have an argument there that other microorganisms means other living things along the lines of uh, mold, fungi, uh, bacteria. When we get into uh, 
you know, the word is known by the company it keeps, we fall into that same, same general doctrine. So I think we have a good ambiguity argument to overcome a, vir a microorganism exclusion that doesn't specifically name virus. Wonderful, wonderful. This has been very helpful information, Paul. Um, I am grateful to you. I know everyone who sees and hears this even after this live broadcast is going to be very grateful to you. Uh, we are up against it. Uh, that being said, if we have any more questions, there are none currently in the chat. Uh, last call, I'll say, if you need to electronically raise your hand or type in a chat question, we will address it for you before we just sign off and leave it out there. Um, going once, folks know that when I leave the team calls, going once, going twice. There's nothing there, Paul. Going three times. Uh, once again, we are grateful, grateful, grateful to you, Paul. Uh, hate to put you on the spot, but it looks like you're coming back next week to uh, finish off the third point, and we'll have more points by then. Uh, thank you to the attendees. Thank you, thank you, everyone who hears this in the way that it's used going forward. Uh, Phil's First Party Parlay brought to you by Morgan & Morgan Insurance Recovery Group. Morgan & Morgan, come see us. Thanks, Paul. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.